Our role as fathers is significant. Your thoughtful leadership, support, caregiving attention to caregiving attention, truth-based leadership, it's essential. It's essential. I don't understand how families make it that aren't truth-based, word-based. I don't. I don't understand people in the world how they make it when they're not faith-based. But they do. So there must be something that God infused into every father. This ability of him to produce and supply. Has to be. I'll show you a verse in a minute that I think will, will ring true to that. Like an engineer, when dad's at the helm, we all arrive on time. Go back to our first slide. Look at this. Go back. There we are, dads. We're at the helm. When dad's the engineer, head of the ship, head of the train, guess what? You're going to reign. You're going to reign. Women by default, moms of, old, of yesteryear, when dad went off to war, they took the helm. Not, per, not literally fabricated for it, not even gifted for it, but they did what they had to do for the sake of the family and the country. They stood at the helm. God bless these women, and we honor and respect them. But dad, that does not exempt us from our role in the family. We need to engage, and we need to move forward and lead our families well as you all do. And when you're doing that, you need to slap yourself on the back and go, I'm doing it because God said so. Amen? Think, think about this. Your wife didn't come with a manual. And kids don't come with instruction guides. Have you ever tried to put your wife together? Oh my goodness. Women are complex. So many bolts, screws, and nuts. It's amazing. Their body war I'm dropping I talk about the woman's anatomy all the time. I'm like, how do you ladies function? You're a well equipped computer. Think about that. You're you're a system that was created by God and it's very complex. And men, you need Holy Spirit to help you to understand how she works. Which which buttons to push at the right time. Right? I'm, I'm, I'm serious. You can say the right thing in the wrong time and it creates an explosion. Say the right thing in the right moment and ooh la la, it's like, wow, I'm in Abraham's bosom. Amen? <laughs> yeah, but I, I'm always saying this to my wife. You women are so complex. I mean, you have to study and understand your body, your hormones and how this all works. It's amazing to me how God designed ladies but he put alongside you ladies a man that can help with the engineering help with the directing right help with the leading and when we do men when we fulfill our role the wife comes right alongside and, and it's smooth sailing co-navigation is so cool you know you never see a ship with one master only up front there's a first mate. Amen. One time I was preaching in a black church. They go, oh, this is First Lady Goodman. I said, stop it. Time out. This isn't First Lady. This is Only Lady. Big difference. They looked at me like, yeah, I don't want ten. I got one. It's Only Lady Goodman. Do you hear me? But when two are at the helm, wow, what can be achieved? You never see uh, an international private plane or a uh, commercial liner fly out with one pilot. Always has a co-pilot. The pilot in command has the responsibility. The co-pilot has an assisting role, getting all the intel so the pilot in command can function accordingly. You see, edifying roles. This isn't jousting for leadership. This is edification for each other. Why? So we equip the family well so we can succeed and win. Does that make sense? So the absence of father is vital in our nation and in our families. We see this over history, how dads got separated from, from family for whatever reason, by choice, by fulfillment. A flash, whatever reason, it's really irrelevant. But when there's that absence of the dad role, the family suffers. 
Doesn't mean they can't move forward. They can, but maybe sometimes limited, right? Not as effective or efficient. Look at this. Statistically, when dads are absent, our homes are harmed. 40% of children don't live with their biological fathers in America. 40%. Some say it's even higher than that. 70% of juveniles incarcerated grew up with only one parent or no parent in the home. Do you hear me? 70%. 22% of children living with a divorced mom repeat a grade while in school. For those that have both parents, only 12%. Listen at that. Co-parenting is the key. Mom and dad being on the same page. Dad, whenever they go to mom and mom says no, it's no. Whenever mom, they go to dad, and dad said no, mom, it's no. And if you need to have a meeting of the minds and a congressional hearing, it's mom and dad at another location away from the constituents called children. Do you hear me? Because they will start jockeying and working like well-greased, uh, what do they call these in Congress? Uh, what are the, the ones that, huh? Special interest group. They will form one. They'll become the perfect lobbyist. Yeah. I'm telling you. You guys know what I'm talking about. So Drop and I, one thing we said is, if you say no, it's no. Just let me know ahead of time that you said no. And, and they would work it. Heckling Kate, well, uh, what do you think, Dad? Well, what did mom think about it? Well, well, no, what'd she think about it? Well, she said, no. Okay, that's what I think about it. But dad, but dad, they knew if they could like, maneuver you, you know, mom, maybe she wasn't in a good mood when we asked her, why don't you go and see if we can go to the movies tonight? I went, stop it, kids. The serpent used that one on Eve. But dad, let me tell you something. If unity can be breached, Deception can enter and watch the family will start to fail. Happened in the first family. It happened in our families. So I'd go, whatever mom said, that's what we're doing. Then if they got older, they'd go, well, who wears the pants around here? I go, both of us. I really like it when mom and I are in the same pants. Those breeches feel good. They'd say, shut up. You're sick. They'd leave me alone then. See, I was working them anyway. But when we're unified, watch. The family's protected. When the family's protected, the family will win. Does that make sense? Put this in your notes. Go with me to 1 Corinthians. God gave me this verse during praise and worship. 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 4, verse 15. Fathers and dads. I, I like to call you dads. That's, that's more of a term of endearment. Look at what Paul was writing to the church at Corinth. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, what an incredible role to be an instructor amongst the beloved in the body of Christ. A role of great responsibility. A role that requires a gift and the anointing. He accustoms the role of dad greater than that. The role of father. Look what he says next. Yet, you do not have many fathers. Look at that. We often think of this as spiritual fathers. We often think of this as covering for a local church or for a ministry team or staff. But I want to take it to the family. See, the role of instructor is good and essential. But we as dads can't just be an instructor. We've got to be the father, the overseer, the covering, if you will, for the family. Mom can try she can step in, she can pinch hit, but ultimately the responsibility, men, is upon you and I because God's gifted us to do it. You know? I'll never forget times when my mom would take us fishing when she was capable or able, and she would try to teach us how to bait the hook. Something was missing. Women grab like worms that are moving like... It's like it don't work. Dad grabs worm. Here's how you do it. Right? Need to change the oil on the car. Mom's out there trying to figure out what wrench will might fit. 
She doesn't even know what a wrench is. Dad steps in and goes, get that wrench over there, son. This is what we need to do. Do you hear me? See, mom-only households can help. They can even grow us and groom us. But let me tell you something. It would be a lot easier and more efficient if there were two at the helm. Does that make sense? If we came by single parent families, let this not make it an excuse. Let's say simply, that's what got us to this point. There is a better way. And God blessed even what we had in our lack. Amen? Let's don't live in our past. Let's live in our future. And let's certainly change our present. Does that make sense? That's good preaching, even if you are a Baptist. Hallelujah. But it goes on to say this. For 10,000 instructors, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. So then he kicks it back to spiritual and he gives the role of him being um, an ambassador of Christ and an apostle of Christ to that of being a father, meaning I begot you. How did I bore you or, or give birth to you was through the gospel. And let me tell you something, fathers, the way you'll change your home is by sharing the good news of the gospel in season, out of season, all the time. Have a verse, have a prayer, have an encourage, uh, encouraging psalm or proverb that you can always instruct with. Amen? Make your mouth full of Scripture. Yeah. Then it gets easier to get rid of the other words. The ones that start with S-H. The G-D. The F word. All these other things that we shouldn't be teaching. That's a foreign language to us. Amen. We often used to say in our home, we would rather say rather you say an absolute curse word in the English language. Literally, than to say the biggest curse word, which is I can't, I'll never, I could never be, I could never have, I could never do that. See, I could never is a serious curse word that will damn a destiny. Do you hear me? Amen. The greatest curse word in the Icelandic language. Some of you may know it. You want to know what it is? Devil. Walk into Iceland and you go, devil. They're all going to go, ah, he cursed. The next one is, what is it? Hell? Like, hell. Ah. Well, those were the ones Drop taught me. That was my two vocabularies. The other one she taught me was... Uh, you want your coffee? It's crummy. Black coffee. So I go, I've got Icelandic the first time. I, uh, I was at, how would you like your co cafe? I go, crummy. Feeling blank. <laughs> yeah, you want to know what I was telling them? I want crow coffee. <laughs> yeah, bring me crow coffee. Got any of that in the house? <laughs> she failed to tell me the word crummy means, you know, it's black, but like crow. Want crow coffee? <laughs> that limited my speaking ability in Iceland. But watch, the role of father is that that's equal to or greater than that of apostle. Why? The apostle teaches and instructs, but one of the greatest roles of apostle is to cover, to guide, to instruct, to impart, to stimulate and cultivate spiritual gifts. To recognize them when they're present. And dad, this is what we do daily with our kids and with our wife. I'm telling you, this is what we do. This is what we do. Moving on. Put this in. Go with me Genesis, but I want you to write this before we get there. Turn to Genesis 127. When dad is missing, the void can't completely be filled. We need the Father's input. We need the Father's direction. And we certainly need His affirmation. Think about that. You know, it's one thing when mom says, oh yeah, you're just nice. You're so beautiful. You're like, mom, you're so ooey gooey nice. You're supposed to say that. It's like God paid you to say that. But when dad says, you know what? You look nice. I like that dress. I like those slacks. I like those heels. Something happens, ladies, doesn't it? It's like... Oh, I really am. Yeah. Dad said so. Yeah. I remember when I took Hecla shopping, she had a presentation at William Jessup. And there's a business presentation. And she needed to look like a business lady. 
I took her out and we bought her some nice heels and some nice slacks. And this, this um, Egyptian blue, I don't know what they call this, real bluish blue blouse. She looked so sharp. And I looked at her and I went, Hecla, you, you're beautiful. You look like a well-groomed businesswoman. She went, you think so, Dad? I went, let me just say it, sis. You're just absolutely hot. She's like, oh, Dad. <laughs> like, serious. Guess what? She went and got the business scholarship. She gave a presentation that beat out one of her friends that was probably sharper, smarter. See? Sometimes it's not in what you know, it's how you present it. Presentation's everything, ladies. And Dad's affirmation on you will make you present everything well, tight fit, put together. Amen? For our sons, I used to look at my son and say, you're so good looking, I want to kiss you. It's like, Dad. It's like, it's like, get over here, I'll kiss you. Always kissed my kids. I remember one time Caleb started becoming a man. It's like, Dad. I'm like, shut up, I made you. I can take you out. I'm going to kiss you. I kiss him on the cheek. I still to this day pray with my son when he's at my home. Sometimes he calls me and wants me to pray for him before he goes to bed. I always tell him I love him. I always tell him, you know what, Caleb? I, I really admire you. I'm so proud of you. But more importantly, I admire you. Why? If dad doesn't affirm him as a young man, I'm not going to allow the world to do that. They'll affirm the wrong things in that young man. Amen? I sent him a video a couple of days ago of of uh, James Brown. Wah, I feel good. He was doing this dance. And I said, son, if you can get this move going on in this swag, I think you'll get married sooner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Have fun with your young men. Amen. And out of fatherhood and dad, you'll be amazed that friendship blossoms. See, Friendship is secondary to father. Sometimes in our culture, we try to make friends before being that role of father or mother. And that's when it gets confusing. Right. So when correction needs to be brought, they, they see you through the light of friend and, you know, they don't listen to their friends. So why should they listen to dad or mom? So we've got to keep our roles defined for their well-being. Does that make sense? Now look at this. Genesis 1.27. So God created man. Darn it. So God created man in his own image. Circle that. In his own image. So when we want to be a great father, let's look to the template, which is heavenly father. I, I didn't know how to be a dad. My dad was absent from our home. I didn't want to learn some of the things that he was functioning in. Do you hear me? So I looked to a grandfather. I looked to an uncle. And I started seeing the good attributes, what I really liked and admired about them, what made me feel warm inside when I was around them, what made me feel confident, assured of myself when I was in their presence. And I started to identify these qualities. And then I started, as I got older, I started studying the Word, and I started seeing these qualities in God. God is the template if we just give them the opportunity. Amen? Look at this. So let us create man in our own image. In the image of God, there it is, he created him. And then it goes on to say male and female, he created them. God was not confused about the matter there. Notice he separated them with the word and. That means there's a divide. So I'm not sharing a bathroom with you. Oh, that's political. Oh, it's so politically correct. When I get done with the bathroom, they're in a lady in One time I was preaching in France as a key speaker at this conference. The pastor takes us to dinner. And in, over there, when you're the speaker, they hide you out because the people will not leave you alone. I'm telling you. So we had got, skipped and jumped through uh, two houses, then we end up in this restaurant. And so um, his, his 
core staff was there and I come in with the lady that was keeping me, his secretary or assistant. And um, so I walk in and I sit down and she's an interpreter. She ran in the 84 Olympics in Los Angeles on the re uh, relay team. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, lady just really was a blessing to me and helped me. And um, uh, but she died of cancer. She was a, a pediatric physician and she died of cancer um, a few years back. But incredible woman. Watch this. So we're sitting there and I, I said, Pastor, I, I've got to go to the restroom. So she's interpreting this into French. It sounds so much prettier in French. Say, no, it's not going to be that pretty. It's <laughs> I got to go. And uh, so she goes, oh, I've got to go. I'll, I'll take you. I'm like, just tell me where it's at. I, I can navigate. I can get there. So she goes, no, I'm going to the bathroom. I'll take you. I'm kind of uncomfortable with this. The only lady that I share a bathroom with is my wife. And that, she made me be like that because she's European. She always wants to come in and talk to me when I'm talking to God on the throne. Like, oh, God. I mean, no, when I'm like, God. <laughs> well, man, this is our day, right? <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> So she gets up, she walks with me. So, so I'm walking, I look back, and, she, and, I, and she's following me. I'm like, why are you following me? I'm going to the bathroom. This is in France. And she goes, no, I'm going too. I'm like, oh, Jesus. And so, so I didn't know this, dummy me. I'm from Farmersville. I go to the bathroom. She goes, well, I'm going that way too. I'm like, there's only one door. She goes, I know, but I'm going to the bathroom. So she opens the door for me. I went, oh, I kind of like this. Anyway, I walk in, and I'm still looking at her. We're sitting in the, we're looking at each other. I'm like, I have to go to the bathroom. She goes, I know, so do I. I'm like, what do you do, draw straws for the bathroom over here? I don't know. <laughs> Dummy me is a communal bathroom. You share the wash basin, the mirrors, and then there's two other doors, and you walk separately. I'm like, okay, bye. That's crazy stuff. Different and messed up my culture. So, so I, I went to the restaurant. I thought, well, I'll hurry up and get out and I'll beat her. And then she opens her door. I'm like, oh, I don't want to be here. Interesting culture, isn't it? Amen. But let me understand or help you understand this. See, times are changing and there are forces that are helping it change in various directions. But you and I, let's be authentic on the truth. Let's stay in the game of faith. Let's stay on the word and watch. God has an innate ability to navigate us no matter what culture says. They may try this for a while and when they don't like it and it's inconvenient for them and it harms them and their agenda, guess what? They'll shift back to the original. That's how it happens. Amen? It's happened from the dawn of time. I don't know why I went down that rabbit trail. Anyways. Back to Father's Day. Look at this. Our template has to be God. No matter what society says, no matter how society wants to change your home, you are the Lord in your house. And it's up to you and our responsibility as believers to teach and instruct the next generation of our household in the Word. Amen? Don't make your Bible and Gospel socially correct. If you would dilute the gasoline in your car with water, what would happen? It's not going to go anywhere. Same as your home. Keep the word authentic. That is the barometer. That is the course. That's hard to translate into Chinese, I know. That is the course. But watch, that's where success will lie, is following Scripture. Amen? Moving on, look at this. Um, I like what Jim... Valavano said he was a basket, collegiate basketball player, I think in the 50s. He said this, my father gave me the greatest gift anyone could give to another person. He believed in me. If dad ever stops believing in the child, guess what? The child will always go into a ditch. Doesn't matter how dark, doesn't matter how bad, doesn't matter how challenged, dad, keep believing. You're the helm. You're at the helm of the ship. You're the engineer of the train. And if you say it's bad, the rest of the family gets the rippling effect of it's bad. But when you say it's good, it's the perfect storm. We're going to make it through. The family says, doesn't matter what we face. The waves are big. Guess what? We're coming through. 
If you're an engineer on a, on a train, it's foggy. It's dense fog. But I have a light, and I know the route we're taking. We're making it through. See, and it's this confidence that becomes contagious in the family unit. When that confidence is bedrocked in the family, nothing will stop your family. No demon in hell, no angel from God. Hear me right now. Nothing on the earth has the power to derail your family. Why? Confidence in God is the bedrock for a believer. Amen? And by the way, the angels of God only know the will of God. So if you have a faux angel show up that tries to tell you a lie, say, be gone from me. It's faux angel, not authentic. Does that make sense? Amen. Amen? Yeah. You'll know the difference. Why? They only speak God's will. They only speak what God assigned them to say. Amen? So if we won't receive from an angelic being a lie, why do we receive from the news a lie? Why do we receive from, you know, uh, Reader's Digest a lie or whatever magazine you read, The Inquirer? The Inquirer, that's a crazy, who would, that's a crazy magazine. It's crazy. I was on the way to church and I looked at it for just a moment. Richard Simmons now thinks he's a lady. I wanted to tell him years ago, no, you're a man. You're just jacked up in your head. Amen? You jazzercised your brain loose. That's all. You wore such tight shorts, it cut the blood flow off to your brain. Amen? When Richard Simmons sings, let's get physical. I don't want to get physical with that. I don't want to show up to exercise with that. With Richard Simmons and you're doing exercise, you don't know whether to put him in the front of the room or the back. Both are dangerous. Amen? It's like, moving on. i got to stay on Scripture today. Look at this. Put this in your notes. If you desire to be a great father, follow the attributes of Father God. It's so simple. So complex. When I talk with my Mormon friend, my LDS friend, we often talk about, they say Father God. So we communicate in Father God. And we talk about what is Father God. What are His attributes? Number one, Father God, look at this, loves unconditionally. It doesn't matter what your kids go through. It doesn't matter what they do. You only are concerned about what they're going to. Why? Unconditional love. They may blow it. They may mess up. And you've got to look at them and go, one day this may be a great message. Let's pick up and go from here. Doesn't mean you don't align and correct. You have to do that also, dads. But you know what? They're bigger than the mess up and the mishap. They're bigger than the speed bump. Amen? You can take a speed bump and make it a cliff with your words. Or you can take a speed bump and diminish it. Amen? That's being the role of dad. Look at this. This is how God operates. Patient and always looking for personal growth. I know it's hard to be patient with our kids sometimes. I understand they push the right buttons, especially those that are athletes. I mean, it's like, what do you tell them to help them succeed on the field? There's a point in time it's hard to say anything to them. They get so sensitive because their game is so close to their heart. It's their passion. It's their desire. Does that make sense? Whatever their endeavor, use wisdom. Look at the template of Father God. What does he do? always encourages tomorrow will be better there's greater insight coming to you i've already provided your faith is operating and you will have the desire of your heart amen second look at this what's father god he's self-sacrificial self-sacrifice he looks out for the common good of all in the family he's willing to give him himself before he asks anything of you Amen? God gave His Son so He could ask you to give your life to the Son. That's powerful. Look, He's caregiver. He knows when to listen and just listen. He knows when to console. He knows when to encourage. And last, He knows when to correct. Role of dad isn't always correction. A lot of times, it's listening. A lot of times, it's drawing near. Sometimes you don't even have the answer. I've looked at Hecla many times and go, Sis, I don't know, but I know this. Let me hug you. 
That always feels good. She's like, Dad, really? No, really. Come here. Let me hug you. Let me hold you. One time I said, you just need to sit on my lap. She's like, dude, I'm going to smash your lap. I go, I know. Those big, muscly legs get up here. I'm like, okay, you can get off my lap now. You're hurting me. <laughs> what is it? Sometimes all you need when things are not going your way is just for your Heavenly Father to wrap you up in His love and just say, settle down. It's going to work out. It's just going to work out. Amen? That's the role of us as Father. Do we always do it? No, not necessarily. But watch. Good parenting is understanding an error and finding a solution. Amen? When you're a good parent, hey, you try so That didn't work. Maybe it worked for little B Billy, but it didn't work for little Susie. you got to align that. When you blow it with your kids, you've got to know you have to go to them and say, would you forgive me? I blew it. Would you forgive me? To the extent in the Goodman household that we blow it is to the extent times two that we make up. When your kids look at you and go, would you two get a motel? It's because we blew it. We didn't tell them. But see, they saw the making up. Hear me, when we would blow it with our kids to the same extent, hug, hold, coddle, make them feel like a winner, and certainly ask them to forgive you. We've done this. I've had to do it. It's humbling, but it's strengthening. Does that make sense? Is this good? Yes is usually yes. Okay. Put this, turn here. Psalms 128.2. Look at this. The role of dad today. Oh my goodness. You're competing with Twitter. You're competing with twerking. With Twitter. <laughs> Snapchat. Oh my goodness. Use Snapchat. I love Snapchat. I love all the faces. <laughs> I love them. I, I get like this. I don't know what they call it. It's like a binge. Snapchat binge. Where I do my, all these funny faces. I have to say all these funny things to my kids. And I'll send like 15 of them at one time. It's like, pfft, bombard them. You can't look at my Snapchat and not smile. I'm going to make it so ridiculous, so stupid, so idiotic. It's going to put a smile on your face. Yeah. One day Caleb was on a date. I was Snapchatting him. And I had the one that makes your face look like a, a like drag. And uh, I, was, <laughs> I was saying things to him like, oh, so who's that girl in the car with you? It, yeah, you've got to make life fun, friend. You're building a relationship that will endure time with your children. Amen. Sometimes we as Christians get fuddy-duddy and boring. We think it's spiritual to be boring. Well, God has a special chamber in heaven for boring Christians. And he won't let them out very regularly. Because heaven's going to be fun, enjoyable. Pleasant, pleasurable, and it's going to endure forever. Amen. Look, Psalms one twenty eight two. When you get, uh, uh, when you eat the labor of your hands, circle that. You shall be happy, and it shall be well with you. There's something about eating from the fruit of your handiwork. See, when when you put your hands on your family men and you massage it and you cultivate it and you care for it. There's some in it, this blessing that just comes out of it and procures that brings an inner satisfaction to you and a contentment of heart. This last week we were up in the Bay Area uh, for my birthday and, and I just kept telling Drop, I feel so blessed, so enriched. You know, we, we use this word in charismatic, oh, I'm blessed. It's almost like I have gas or something. But we miss the meaning of it. Watch. I'm so blessed. I'm so enriched. I'm so happy. I'm so content. I feel so put together when my kids are prospering, when my wife is content and joyful and feels together. Do you understand, men? This is the fruit of our hands. It's a blessing. And look, when you eat of the labor of your hands, when you feast on the fruit of your family. I'm telling you, many cultures get this. The Italians get this. The Hispanics get this. The um, Armenians get this. The value of family. 
we in America sometimes feel so disenfranchised of where we came from, what we're about, and what makes us unique on the planet. We don't always understand this as other cultures. But I'm telling you, there's something so unique about a family. So valuable and precious. Amen? Look at this. The hand that doesn't work will never know the happiness of this passage. If we say, que sera, sera with our family, whatever will be, will be, you'll never have the fulfillment of the happy fruit of the family. Some people think they can't direct their family. We just had these children, and however it works out, it just works out. Kind of like chickens that hatch little chicks. They all get fried. Amen? They get fried. You're not raising friars. You're raising champions. Amen? And a champion doesn't always have the medals right away. They have a few pulled muscles, a few torn ligaments, a few surgeries. They go through some things, a few separated ribs, knotted up noses and eyes, depending on what craft you're in and going to rule and reign as champion. So whatever you're going through today, it will just be a scar that will certify your victory tomorrow. Does that make sense? I'm working with a, a sharp man that works for our company out of Portland. Incredible man. And our relationship has gone from business to now it's going deeper into core beliefs. It's going deeper into the road and path he came down. And I see my assignment in this man's life as more than employer. It is that of speaking to his future and his destiny and telling him, guess what? You blew it. That's all right. But life's not over. It was a speed bump. And your greatness is still ahead of you and can be apprehended. I, I'm telling you, I have this way with people that come from Catholicism that are Catholics. This is an Irish Catholic. I love to talk to him because he's got this brogue. They're fun. I, I would love to hear a spirit-filled Irish person. I'd love to hear him talk in tongues. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Yeah, or Scotsman and talking tongues. I thought he to hear it. Yeah, I love it. And so when we talk, it's gone to a whole different level. Why? Because I believe true success is in the depths that few ever go to, which is core beliefs. How do you see God? How do you know God? What is God saying to you? And when you have that as your core, you will succeed at life. It may come with great enduring, but you will succeed. And more importantly, you will feast off of the labor of your hands. So ask the question, what do I want that feast to look like? What do I want it to taste like? How do I want it to be garnished? Go to the Fernandez household. It, trust me, it's a feast. It's a garnish. I love when they invite me. You want to know why? Because they do what my wife can't do. <laughs> Presentation. My wife cooks like a Viking. Here's meat. Good. Eat. You have a knife and fork. No need. No fork, no knife, only sword. <laughs> She's Armenian. She puts it all out. I mean, it's all of the flavors mixed. You leave there, man, you feel like you've been in a spice rack. Amen? I'm telling you, we love it. We always get in the car, drop, and I go, man, aren't the Fernand isn't that great? I love eating here. She goes, I know. When are we coming back? I'm like, I don't know. Let's call them up before we leave the driveway. When's the next holiday? Today? Oh, great. Thank God. Why? They understand what it is to feast around a table. Their culture is around food. I mean, the Armenians, it's around food, man. Who do you know can take a leaf off of a vine, wrap something in it, and go, man, this is delicacy. Like, are you kidding me? And we go, oh, it is. It's so good. You'll eat anything, even grape leaves when you're around these people. Amen. It's true. Why? Because they value the giving of food, the hospitality sown to another family. Their culture was built on it. When they were decimated, one thing they all held was we've got family and we can come together and share and we can be here for the well-being of all. Amen? I saw in the news they finally recognized what had happened after all these years. 
Hallelujah. See, there's never a drop of blood that hits the ground that will not speak and the Father doesn't recognize. I don't care what kinder of people you are, where you come from, when there's spilt blood and it's done unlawfully, God will oversee it and it will echo to many generations. Amen? Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Look at this. We shall be well. It will be well with us. Happy, satisfied. Put this in your notes. We can't expect to enjoy the fruit if we've never developed a strong root. You can't. In the family, you've got to have a root. You've got to take that root deep because it becomes the core of what we believe. The root system is the most vital part of a plant. It determines its longevity and fertility. The root system. Put this in your notes. When our children see us work hard, provide for the family and plan for the future, it brings security to their hearts. They know things are going to work out. When dad has to leave the home early in the morning, kiss them goodbye, and they know he's off to work, there's something in them that says, you know what? There's a promise here. If I work, I will eat. Because the Bible says, you know worky, you know eaty. Right? It teaches them that they have to be uh, articulate. They have to put their hand to something. They have to have a personal vision. They have to have commitment. And more importantly, they have to have action and motivation to carry it out. Amen? That's why it's vital for dad to have a job. Now, a job, watch, is a journey of blessing. Hello? I'm glad I have a job. It gives me some worth on the planet. It's a journey of blessing. It doesn't always work out the way I like, but it's a journey of blessing. Amen? A job is not a four-letter word. It's a three-letter word. Yeah. Look at this. Never pass on the, never pass on the last supper mentality. Don't do that. We don't have enough. We're out of money. You know, they're laying off at the plant. Don't have that as dinner conversation. My God, that would give anybody indigestion and gas and heartburn. It should be, you know what? Everything's well. We're going to make it. Things are good. Well, I'm hearing they're laying off over a GM. Well, Ford's hiring. You've got to capture it in the moment and twist it the right way. Because it's a seed, and the seed goes in the ground and germinates, and it will produce after its own kind. If the kind was negative, derogatory, and failure, that's what it produces. It does. You've got to capture it right there. Amen? Yeah. Look at this. So the Last Supper is I'm going to eat, I'm going to die, get crucified. You're all going to cry because of my absence. And I'm going to go to heaven, sit at the right hand of the Father. Yeah, I'm going to provide great things to you, but I'm going to be absent. Too many times do we sit at the table and it's as if we're having the Last Supper. Should not be. That's in here today, kids. I'm losing my job. They're going to repo the cars. They're going to foreclose on the home. And we're gone. I think we're going to go to Kmart and buy a little pup tent. They're pretty cheap right now. They're on sale. The Last Supper. The Last Supper. The Last Supper. And we literally teach the next generation that God is limited in His reach and God will not provide. Put this in your notes. My dad was my best friend, my greatest role model. He was an amazing dad, amazing coach, mentor, soldier, husband, and friend. Tiger Woods said that about his dad. He never said in the statement, I've become a great golfer. No, all attention was to his dad and all the attributes that he received from his father. Psalms 128.3, look at this. Your wife shall be like a fruit vine. I like that. She's like a fruit vine. Have you ladies ever tried to kill ivory out of your garden? Oh, see, right there it is. Ivy, you ladies are something else. I'm telling you, well, look at this fruit vine. Ivy, I, we had ivy in one of our homes, and I kill it back, cut it out. And, and then it gets so, like, entwisted and ingrained in whatever it's growing up. You pull it, and it won't come loose. You guys know what I'm talking about. Has these little tentacles. Those are of the devil. They just like wrap around anything and start crawling and growing, right? Yeah. I had stubborn ivy. I didn't have to water the stuff. It was like from the pit of Sheol. It would just like grow, right? 
I go out there and bind and loose and chop, and it still didn't impact it. But watch, a, wa a wife is like this to us. Not in the derogatory sense, Richard. <laughs> but in the good sense. Watch, in the good sense. Watch, because this is a fruitful vine, right? Not just a wayfaring vine, as the Bible talks about, but a fruitful vine. Why? She knows how to wrap her tentacles just right around you and produce good fruit. Amen? She knows how to cultivate what's going on in the family and keep it held together. You know what I'm saying? The family can literally have a bad season. Watch, heat comes in and it won't kill out this vine. Why? She's well watered. And this is the blessing of this wife. Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine. Good fruit, lovely fruit, voluptuous fruit, tasty fruit. Amen? Wine level fruit. Not every grape is good for wine. But this one is fine wine. And this is the wife that comes along to co-lead a family. Does that make sense? Your children like olive plants. Look at that. All around your table. That's speaking of family. That's speaking of unity. Coming together. Kononia. Communication. Fellowship. Intimacy being shared amongst your conversation. Do you hear me? This is a blessing from God. When it speaks of olive plants, it was the future posterity of, of Israel. The olive tree was not only fruit, but it was also wood for furnishings. Right. And not only wood for furnishings, but in the fruit was the oil they needed for precious worship unto God, the anointing oil. Matter of fact, there wasn't ever a person put in any level of office, whether under a king or a judge. Look, watch this over Israel that wasn't anointed with olive oil. They used olive oil as a signet of God's anointing, God's covering, God's instatement and signet of leadership. Amen. Imagine that. Even Saul was anointed with it. But he was anointed out of a flask made by man's hand. Whereas David well, was anointed out of a flask that came off of a ram. God made. I'm telling you as father, your anointing is God made out of the horn of a ram. Amen. Look at verse 4. Behold, thus shall man be blessed who fears the Lord. This word fear here means to rever. And I like this one, reference. When you rever God, you reference God because you see his vast wisdom. When we reference God, watch, we rever God because we receive his wisdom. And then out of that, look, comes submission to greater authority that has the power to change things beyond my control. Reverence, fear of the Lord. Can you take three more minutes? OK, how about two? Look, our table conversation speaks of leadership, enjoyment, optimism, family value. It's quality time, not always quantity. Amen. I know kids don't know the difference. They want quantity. But we also in our quantity have to have moments of quality. Amen. You can have a lot of dresses in your closet, but which ones are quantity versus quality? Quality are the ones you pull out for special times. What about, let's go to flatware. Uh, my wife's not really into china and flatware and crystal. I'm trying to pray that into our household. And, um, but when I go, I love fine china. I do. The, the kind of china that when you touch it, you almost see through it. I mean, it's like, this is good stuff. I like the silver that they had to polish before you got there. Because it's the real deal. Real silver. I've eaten off of crystal so that if you hit it, you're like, you're like me being goofy, like tink, you hit your teeth on it because you don't know when to shut up because you want to talk when you drink. All of a sudden it rings. See, I, I, I know what it's like. And you ladies know what I'm talking about. You can pick up uh, glassware and then you pick up crystal from Czechoslovakia. It's different. It's like, hold on. Got to get my drink glass. <laughs> drink of water. It's like. What's the problem? It's lead crystal, okay? And it's like. It takes muscles. 
Why? It's so heavy. See, there's things of God that He wants to infuse into your life that are weighty and heavy. But if we only have this cheap level, just everyday run-of-the-mill glassware, sometimes we miss the value that He wants to infuse into us. Does that make sense? Fathers, I'm going to tell you something. It's one thing to sit at your table when we're eating off paper. It's another thing to sit there when it's like a king's spread. Amen. We have this long table in our house and it has two leaves. And on occasion, I'll put the two leaves in it and I'll cook for Drop and I and I make her sit at the far end of it. I have to look through the candle sconces like, could I get you something? Ding, ding. What? I, I, I. Do you need, 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 need? It's the king's court in the Goodman household. Yeah. Sometimes we miss moments because we have a paper mentality and God's trying to transition us to king mentality. Amen? Yeah. It's really nice. Do you need, need, need? Water, water, water. Get servant, servant, servant. And then you become the servant. Yes. Yes. And you serve them. Come on now. Amen. I remember one time the kids wanted to go camping. My wife loathes camping. Her definition of camping is go get a hotel right on the beach. Watch a campfire on television. Right? Flip the channel. There's a campfire. There we go. Right? Definition campfire. One time we were in a room. I had a jacuzzi and a remote control. She goes, what's this for? I went, watch. Pooh, the fire lights. Amen. That's like cool. It's like, chh, chh. I'm the man, girl. That's right. <laughs> right? So she, I go, honey, the kids want to go camping. She goes, you'll go alone. I'm like, where'd that come from? I'm like, no. She wanted to go. So what did we do? We put the tent in the backyard and we camped at the Goodman household. Oh, yeah. I made breakfast out there. My old Coleman stove one. I have an authentic one. Well, my wife gave it away. But you had to put <laughs> white gas in it and you had to some of you don't know you guys bought this modern stuff like you know light it with a big light not mine mine you got a pump and you got to pray the thing don't blow up when you light it that's that's real camping man that takes faith it's like you better get smoky the bear around i could set this whole thing on fire amen yeah so we camped out in the backyard yeah me and the kids amen Look at this. Put this in your notes. I'm a strong person. I'm a strong family man. I'm a strong husband. And I'm a strong father. Men, this needs, this needs to be our speech when we look in the mirror. David Beckham said that. Look beyond all the tattoos, all the stuff, and you'll see husband, family man, father, great player, and a good career man. Amen? Second Chronicles 31.20. Look at this. Look at Hezekiah. Do you know Hezekiah died whenever he's 39 or 40? He died young. Some people say, oh, I want to go back to the Old Testament. They all died early, man, other than Methuselah. I think, he, yeah, God just didn't know what to do with them. So you're going to keep them on the earth till he figures out what he's going to do in heaven. We got Methuselah down there. The guy's like, you know, 900 years old. <laughs> when are we going to bring him up here? Oh, not today. Why? We got nothing for him to do. Think about that. Heaven was still being created probably. Methuselah. No place to put the boy. <laughs> Anyways, here we have Hezekiah, great king. Comes in after a raunchy king. Here's a promise for you. It doesn't matter what governmental leader we have or the nations of the world have. All we need is one man or woman to step in there with righteousness and everything can shift and change. Look at Chronicles when you study it. Israel had dirty, rotten scoundrels at times, heathens, idolaters, new agers, and then all of a sudden, boom, God's man step in and everything change. Amen? Here we have it. So thus Hezekiah did throughout all, circle that, all of Judah. And he did what was good, circle that, what was right and what was true. This is how we lead our families in a culture that seems like the wheels are coming off of it. We have to do what's good, what's right, and what's true. Amen? That has to be the bedrock. And he did this before the Lord his God. 
It doesn't matter what Joe Schmo down the road's God is. It only matters what the Goodman God is. The God of your household. Who do you serve? Who do you put your trust? Who are you putting your faith in? Because that's the God of heaven and earth. And when you put your faith in Him, all things are possible because you believe. Amen? I'm about ready to go TD right here. 21, look at this. And in every work, circle it, every work, not just some, that he began in the service of the house of the Lord. We have to understand church is where we congregate to celebrate. Watch, everything I do in the world is service unto the Lord. Whether it's flipping real estate, whether it's flipping stock, whether it's taking care of product and service for retail, whether it's commerce on the internet, everything you touch is to the glory of God. Everything. And it's under the service of the Lord. Everything. The reason being is your hands will prosper and you are a covenant person. Whatever it touches, God just rubbed on it. Whatever it is, God just got employed with it. God just got connected. Why? Covenant doesn't stop at the front door. This is where we as Christians mess up. We think if this is the room, you know, we walk in, oh, I'm in covenant. Oh, I'm in covenant. Then all of a sudden I walk out the room. I just left covenant. I just left covenant. No, in covenant, this is the world. You're a covenant-keeping believer with God. This entire world God owns. You're in alignment for blessing wherever you go. Amen? I was speaking this to my Irish friend. I said, let me tell you something. Faith is now, and it's a substance of what you hope for. And as you engage that faith, it starts fabricating your future. It doesn't look to the past to recertify whether you're capable or not. It looks forward to the promise and says, God said it. I'm called to do it. Deliver it. Bottom line. Amen. How do you initiate? I said, with your mouth. Ladies, with our mouth, we all got into trouble. With our mouth, we get out of trouble. Amen. As we speak, we believe, and we have. Does that make sense? So many times we rob ourselves because we keep God at the church and not God on Main Street. Come on now. God is with you and in covenant wherever you go. He knows it's a dark world. And the way that he enlightens the world is with your light. Amen? I can't do that. Who says so? Look at me. Who says you can't? Only you. God said you can. So who's lying here? Amen? Look at this. It goes on to say, and we'll finish with this. And in every work that he began at the service of the house of God, in the land and in the commandment to seek his God, he did it with all his heart. So he prospered. Prosperity rests at this. All of the heart being engaged. Notice he did it under the command and the law. That's covenant speech. When you're in covenant with God, all your heart has to be invested. You can't get this mentality. Well, it hasn't worked yet or it didn't work. Yes. Well, it's not working now. No, I'm totally in. Lock, stock and barrel. Amen. Amen. Our leadership as dad impacts the nation and our families. That's how vital it is. As the dads go in this nation is how the nation will go. Amen. When it's anything goes with us, guess what? Anything goes at the top. But whenever it's no straight and narrow with you and I, it'll become straight and narrow at the White House. And the whole nation will prosper because of it. Amen? The Bible is real clear. When a righteous man lead, the nation prospers and rejoices. Amen? Praise the Lord. That's good preaching, no matter if you're Baptist. Watch. Men, if we don't, who will? Because we make the difference. We make up the difference. Close your Bible, amen? Is that good preaching? Dad, are you in the engineer of the train? Are you in the engine? Or are we on the caboose? I've talked with dads in the past. They lead from the caboose. And they wonder why the train's always going off the track. You can't. you got to lead from up front. You got to lead from the helm. Amen. And with God's help, you can do it. Lift your hands. Father, thank you for today. We're grateful for this time. We get to honor our dads and fathers. We're grateful that we get to speak these words of encouragement into their life. Father, I thank you that it's your wisdom 
that will guide us. It's your wisdom that will bring enlightenment to us. It's your wisdom that will be a template for us to function with and under. So Lord, help us in our endeavor as dads. Give us the insight we need. Give us the voice in the middle of the night that we must hear. Give us that ability to hear your Spirit speak to us so that we can lead our families well. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You view them by television. You may feel inadequate at times. You may feel as if, you know, you haven't put it all together, so why should the family follow? You may feel as you've failed them or you've erred. Remember, we serve the God of many chances. Unconditional love. Don't let a moment go by without contacting your kids, your family. Don't let a moment go by that you don't contact your wife and get engaged with the family again. Today's the day of salvation. The word salvation means restoration. It means life gained. A recapturing of that that was lost. Do you hear me? When we save somebody that's drowning, we're helping them recapture life. Bringing stability into an unstable situation. Today's the day. Engage the family again. Speak the words that will bring restoration, hope, and alignment. Amen. Never forget, your greatest responsibility is to lead the next generation in the truth. The workable side of the Bible that we live by daily. Amen. Praise God. Thank you, Holy Spirit.